Their training methods were the most scientific. Their athletes the best Nothing in the goes. world. When it came to sports, the Soviet Union was truly the big red machine. But in a country where almost nothing worked, sports worked. Every gold medal was a triumph for the Soviet system. Sport was there to promote communism. Communism is now dead. Soviet sports are dying, the stadiums are empty. Top athletes have moved to the West. The glory days are over in a country where sports were always more than a game. Perhaps the greatest sports dynasty in history. Its teams triumph more consistently than the old New York Yankees over a longer period of time than the Boston Celtics. Gymnastics, track, weightlifting, it almost didn't matter what sport. Once the Soviets got involved, they usually dominated. But now that the Soviet Union has collapsed, there are revelations about just how that success was achieved and maintained. We always heard about scientific training and great coaching. We didn't hear about the drugs and exploitation. This was a nation in which the wrong result could earn an athlete a trip to Siberia. That actually happened to one former player, and you'll meet him in a few minutes. During this program, we'll look back at the Soviet Union's great triumphs, and we'll hear from some of the amazing Soviet athletes. In the wake of all the political turmoil, Soviet domination of sports seems a lifetime ago. In a sense, it was. But the world record holder striking for home. The Russians won, two, three. This was a scene we witnessed time and again. Soviet athletes at the Olympic Games, leaving the rest of the world in the dust. 153.42, a new world record. I think it achieved a success in sport that is unique in the history of sport, and particularly in the history of the Olympic Games. Not only has the Soviet Union, for example, won every Olympic Games for which it has entered, with the exception of 1968 in the summer and 1980 and 84 in the Winter Games, um, it was by far the most versatile nation at the sole Olympic Games and the Winter Games of the same year, 1988, winning, 20, uh, winning medals in 21 of the 23 sports. No one has ever come near to that before. So the gold medal in the first of the women's apparatus finals goes to... But the Soviet Union's long-standing domination of international sports may have died right along with communism. A clean sweep on the medals in the hammer. Union. You will still see top flight athletes because there are people in the pipeline who are going to be top flight athletes. But I think the organization is beginning to disintegrate and I think the ability to mount a team effort is going to disintegrate. And people really want to represent their own country. They want to represent the Ukraine or Georgia or Lithuania. They don't want to represent the Soviet Union anymore. So especially in team sports, I think where you could have drawn the best and the brightest from this vast country, you'll see fewer victories, less ability, because that's the nature of what happens as this empire breaks itself apart. Top athletes stood apart from their Soviet comrades. They were a privileged class in a supposedly classless society. Now that the Soviet Empire has broken apart, those elite athletes are faced with a harsh reality. The ones who want to be world-class athletes now know the training is going to be harder to get, the money to go to events is going to be more difficult to obtain, and even when they win, they're going to go home and they're going to get a few handshakes and a clap on the back, but basically they're not the huge heroes that they used to be. As far as the public is concerned, and this is part of a Russian propensity to go from one extreme to another, there's a feeling that sport, particularly Olympic sport, was connected with all that was bad in society, in the old regime. It was connected with politics and ideology. Sport was there to promote communism. Every international success was a success for the leaders and communists. From the earliest days of the Soviet Union, sports and physical education were considered essential tools of government policy. Lenin wanted to create a new Soviet man, mentally and physically. In the initial period of Soviet development, there was 
a feeling that sport was too narrow a concept. It was physical culture. And this was going to be a model of physical culture for a developing society, a society that has a 80% peasant illiterate population. And therefore, you'll find uh, fields of peasants with sickles uh, and scythes, uh, with music in the background, simulating work movements, with a big backdrop saying, Zdorovom tjelje, zdorovi duh, a healthy uh, mind in a healthy body. So somehow, if you can get people involved in rational sport, you can get people to wash and clean their teeth. You can therefore not only improve the physical health, but the social health too. And it was a very noble era uh, in terms of the people who wanted to develop this new culture for a new society. Of course, I have to say, for many workers and peasants, life was tough enough without jumping up and down with a sickle and a hammer in your hand. Gyms and stadiums were almost non-existent, but there was a widespread enthusiasm for sports. Then the central government began spending money to build facilities. Just a few years after the revolution, a number of athletic clubs were established, including the most famous club of all, Moscow Dynamo. Well, in 1923, the head of the secret police, a man called Dzerzhinsky, decided that the, the security forces ought to have its own um, sports club really to train shooting, I have to say, uh, which wasn't funny for the people who were shot, but, uh, and they set up Dinama, which was power in motion, as Dzerzhinsky called it. And uh, Dinama therefore came into being specifically as the sports club of this tentacular uh, security forces organization. And it was only later that um, it developed into one of the, the biggest club, in fact, uh, open to everyone, not just security people. Moscow Dynamo grew into the biggest and most powerful sports organization in the country. It was the home of Soviet champions. And over the course of 40 years, Dynamo athletes accounted for nearly half the country's Olympic gold medals. Right now, Dynamo faces an uncertain future. Its stadium is usually empty. Its generous government subsidies have been cut off. These are terrible times for a club that used to represent the very best of Soviet sports. Things were much different back in 1928. That's when Dynamo hosted the Soviet Union's first international soccer tournament. Nikolai Starostin was captain of the Soviet team. He and his teammates played before huge crowds in a brand new stadium. Usually, the stadiums were 100% full. To get a ticket for the soccer game at the Dynamo Stadium, which was constructed in 1928 and could seat about 42,000 people, was almost impossible. By then, Joseph Stalin was consolidating his vast power over Soviet life. He felt sporting festivals would help mold the widespread Soviet Union into one nation. But there were still no plans to compete with the rest of the world. There was no thought in the 1930s that Soviet teams would take on the best in the world. They didn't join any international uh, sports federation until after the last war. Uh, partly because Stalin himself was dead against playing against uh, capitalist teams, uh, but also because the level of Soviet sport was relatively low, and uh, it was thought that, that Soviet athletes could not beat the best in the world. Soccer was the main spectator sport. Nikolai Starostin was one of the most famous players in the country. Long live our great and glorious country. Long live our glorious leader, Comrade Stalin. In 1938, Starostin was coach of Moscow Spartak. His three brothers were also on the team. In one game, they made the mistake of beating Dynamo, which was supported by the KGB. Постепенно, постепенно, но наши отношения 
Step by step, our rivalry with Dynamo became more dramatic. In 1938, this competition reached its peak in the semi-final of the National Cup. Spartak were playing Dynamo Tbilisi. Spartak won, won nothing. The chairman of the KGB at that time was named Beria. He reported to Stalin that the score of the game had been deliberately fixed. So Stalin ordered us to play the semi-final again after we had already won the final. In other words, Stalin expected Spartak to lose. But Starostin and his teammates failed to get the hint. We played it again, and we won again. But the end of the story is quite sad because... One starry night, we four brothers were all arrested. We were sentenced to 10 years in concentration camps. The Sarastin brothers were put away in prison camps. They stayed there for 12 years and weren't allowed to return to Moscow until Stalin had died. It was a harsh penalty for winning a game, even by Soviet standards. As important as sports were inside the country, the Soviet Union under Stalin stayed away from most international competitions. That all changed when Nikita Khrushchev took control of the Kremlin. Suddenly, the rest of the world got its first close look at Soviet athletes, and the rest of the world was amazed. Stay with us. The Soviet sports became even more important. There was a Cold War in progress, and athletes were the soldiers. Think of it the way the Soviet leadership thought of it. It was a one-way mirror. They could see out at the West, and they could see what the West had and what the West was becoming, but they wouldn't let the West see in. So their intent was to create some imagery that showed that they were just as good as what they were seeing out of that one-way mirror. Sport was incredibly important. You can organize, you can draw together the best sportsmen and sportswomen and send them out on the world stage and they win a lot of events and people think hey you must have a pretty good country the olympics were the soviet's main battleground runners like vladimir kutz became household names as they gathered gold medals And Soviet athletes began showing up in other sports as well. At Beckenham, Russia's senior state tennis coach keeps an eye on 17-year-old Anna Dmitrieva, who's been making her appearance in the Kent Championships. Anna, who comes from Moscow, and Andrei Potanin of Leningrad, another 17-year-old, may be seen at Wimbledon, probably in the junior event. The advance guard, no doubt, of a future Russian challenge for world tennis titles. Wherever she went, young tennis star Anna Dimitrieva was accompanied by an agent from the KGB. In some countries, it led to problems. Even when I was the only player, I was considered a delegation, and I had to have a chaperone. Once I went to Algeria, it was very, very French, with a French view of life. Well, I was accompanied by an elderly man. When we got there, nobody could understand the Soviet regulations, so they thought it was some kind of liaison, some kind of secret. So we were given two rooms in the hotel which were connected by a secret door. No one could understand our funny way, so we always had these problems. Anna's career was closely controlled by the Soviet Central Committee in Moscow. Depending on the politics of the moment, the committee decided when and where she could play. In 1961, when we got to England, the possibility of a boycott was in the air, and we were expecting a phone call from Moscow using a secret code phrase. 
If we were told that our grandmother had suddenly fallen ill, that meant that we should immediately leave England and begin the boycott of South Africa. That was in 1961. But that year we were very lucky and our grandmother's health became better, and so we were allowed to stay and play in England. By the next year at Wimbledon, the decision had been made and I became the first Soviet player to implement the boycott. I was forced to boycott my good friend, Annette Van Ziel. The newspapers knew about it before we did. The state completely controlled um, sport, and it wasn't the um, athletes or the coaches who dictated policy. It was always the... Um, chairman of the sports committee, who was a political appointment and had always to be a, a long-serving party member who graduated through a party school and service in the Young Communist League normally. Uh, but even then, um, policy was always dictated from above. Communist party control even extended to pre-game pep talks from party leaders. Sergei Baltichov was a member of the Soviet Union's national soccer team. Of course, it made us laugh when we listened to a person who was not a professional trying to teach professionals how to play. We couldn't object openly since those people had great powers and the consequences would have been bad. After they left, we always used to laugh. It's very funny when you're taught how to play and how to run by these people. It was very funny. But despite the interference, Soviet athletes achieved tremendous international success. That was especially true in women's sports. I think one of the great achievements of the Soviet Union was the opportunity that it gave to women in many different sports to uh, develop their talent and to uh, mount the world stage. Russian women traditionally, Slav women, have come from the countryside where it's darn cold for six months of the year. And indeed, you marry a woman, uh, or you have done traditionally, um, according to how long she's going to last and how much work she's going to do for you on the land. And therefore, the, the stereotype of um, uh, a big woman uh, who's very strong um, is, has been a very popular one. It's changed in the past 20 or 30 years, but it wasn't so difficult for Russian women, Soviet women generally, to put the shot and uh, uh, throw the javelin. There are two women who fit that stereotype perfectly, the sisters Tamara and Irina Press. We'll hear from them in a moment, and we'll look at the famous Soviet training methods. They were known for having the best coaches and the best scientists. As it turns out, they also had the best drugs. More than a game will continue in a moment. In the late 1950s, Tamara Press was a level above the rest of the world in women's shot put and discus. Tamara and her sister, Arena, became household names on both sides of the Atlantic. Both had been singled out by Soviet coaches in elementary school. As with everybody else, it all started in school. And then I was lucky. My coach in Samarkand recommended me, and later Irina, to the best track and field coach of the day. His name was Viktor Alexeyev. So we moved to Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. At first I just ran and jumped. Then Tamara started shot putting. I couldn't do that, but I helped her training. I did all kinds of track and field events. The Press sisters dominated at two different Olympic Games. Arena won the 80 meter hurdles in 1956, the pentathlon in 1960. In both Olympics, Tamara won the shot put and the discus. And they weren't alone. The Soviet system produced champion after champion. Communism couldn't put meat on the table, but it could certainly win gold medals. The sense I had in the Soviet Union was that in a country where almost nothing worked, sports worked. And it was very well organized, 
clearly it was an extraordinarily high priority to Soviet leadership to make this successful and to make this world class. And they started children, you know, like that. Little children are, are, were brought into these schools, the training begins, the selection process, who's going to be a gymnast, who's going to be a runner, who's going to be a swimmer. And this was extreme high priority. And it sort of proved the point that if you have a poor country, but you marshal what resources you have and you focus it on one little thing, you can do very well. Nearly every day, another sports complex is opened. The state spends over 100 million rubles a year on sport. During the 1950s and 60s, new gyms and stadiums were built throughout the Soviet Union. According to party propaganda, they were intended for the welfare of the general public. In fact, these facilities were part of a giant machine that churned out exceptional athletes. Potential stars were identified almost from birth, and Soviet scientists used all their expertise to help young athletes develop. That included using the latest drugs, and the latest way to conceal drugs. A great deal of um, expertise was poured into sports medicine. Uh, this was particularly important, of course, uh, in terms of drugs. There was the these Germans and the Soviet athletes used to say, well, at least we're being monitored properly when we take our drugs, uh, unlike you in the West, take them haphazardly. And in fact, very few Soviet athletes were ever um, caught taking drugs. There were a few, but not very many. It's not because they didn't take them. We now know almost daily in the Soviet press names of uh, Alexeyev, the great weightlifter, who Yuri Vlasov uh, says in the press uh, regularly took anabolic steroids, that they took um, uh, maturity um, preventing or retarding drugs, blood doping, all this was done, but under very uh, close supervision of a very large number of people throughout the health and scientific community. Beginning in the earliest grade, Soviet children were regularly tested using the latest technology. Scientists determined which sport was most compatible with an athlete's natural ability. Then the athlete was pushed in that direction. There are factors which determine if children are genetically suited for sports. Some people are better equipped for the training required by high-level competition. All this testing could identify potential athletes. But as the doctors discovered, even the best technology could not predict who would eventually become a champion. Our doctors were doing research. They were checking the speed of movement and also the reaction speeds of different groups of sportsmen. The results were quite unexpected because we found that the quickest reactions of all came from the chess players. We can explain this phenomenon because the speed of mental reactions is closely related to the speed of physical reactions. Gymnast Nelly Kim was a product of the Soviet system. Looking back now, she doesn't attribute her success to science and technology. According to her, the Soviets excelled for a very simple reason. They had the best coaches. I was an average schoolgirl. I was nine years old and in the third grade. My future trainer came to my class at school and said, I would like to take this and this and this girl. And so I was selected. From the age of nine, I started doing gymnastics. There are scientific tests to help find future gymnastic stars, but I don't believe in them. I believe in the intuition and experience of the coaches. 
So when my coach selected me, he was not thinking of any ability I might have, but he realized that I was very keen to train hard. Whatever the reason, the Soviets kept developing world champions, especially in gymnastics. Ludmila Tereshava was one in a long line of Olympic gold medal winners. I began training two or three times a week for about one and a half or two hours. But later on, when I started making progress, I began training more often. And when I became a member of the Soviet national team, I was training every day and sometimes twice a day for about six hours. It was professionalism. A potential champion like Ludmila Torosheva had everything at her disposal. The finest facilities, the best coaches, and the opportunity to train whenever she wanted. The system was behind its athletes all the way. In return, the system expected championships and gold medals. Well, the first reaction when you have won is that you are a member of the national team. You feel happy that you have fulfilled the tasks set for you by the Soviet Sports Committee. First you get satisfaction from that, that you've achieved your goal. And then, then comes your own personal happiness. Mm. Oh, no. I felt I'd done it for myself. It was for me. Me and my coach, we did it together. Of course, it is glory for your country and to see the flag raised. I don't know what sort of child might think that he or she does something for the motherland, or for the state, or for the government. A child does it for herself, first of all, and then comes the rest. Nellie Kim and Ludmilla Torosheva seem to look back on the Soviet system with some affection. Other athletes look back with anger, especially the many professional athletes who have moved to the West. For years, they were virtual prisoners, unable to leave their team or their country. They'll talk about the dark side of Soviet sports when more than a game returns. For any Soviet athlete, there is nothing more rewarding than to see the red flag saluting the triumphs of Soviet sport. Success in sports meant success for the entire Soviet nation. It's the same philosophy they brought to defense and being a superpower. It's the same philosophy they brought to their space program. Huge resources applied primarily to the point of showing that this country was a world-class country, even though they well knew this was a country whose infrastructure was deteriorating and whose political will was exhausted. In 1980, the Soviet Union hosted the Olympic Games for the first time. The U.S. boycotted these games to protest the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Still, this was a crowning achievement for Soviet leaders who were on hand to bask in the glory reflected by their athletes. Up it goes. And he takes the lead, 237.5, and nobody's going to better that. Salnikov, 35 meters out in front, all by himself, and it's a new world, an Olympic record, a superb swim. Full twist on, touches. Soviet athletes dominated the Moscow Games, but at the same time, there was a growing criticism of the sports establishment. Elite athletes were the target of jokes about their lack of education. <laughs> Russians have a saying, I have two sons. One is smart. Unfortunately, the other one is a sportsman. <laughs> Yevgeny Zemin was a Soviet hockey star and coach of the national team. He led a campaign intended to draw attention to the exploitation of Soviet athletes by the state. You know, as far as I know, we never 
In this country, no one thought seriously about education for athletes or about what they were going to do at the end of their sporting careers. So they were squeezing everything out of the sportsmen. If the sportsman was talented, they were very demanding. And after that, they threw the person away, just as they would throw a kitten in the river. And they were expected to survive. Compared to other Soviet citizens, professional athletes were paid relatively well. But their salaries were laughable compared to professional athletes in the West. I started with 60 rubles a month, but when I became a professional on the national ice hockey team of the Soviet Union, I was getting 300 rubles a month. We thought that was good money, but when we met the Canadian professionals, we came to the conclusion that we were playing almost for free. This is where many Soviet hockey stars dreamed of playing in the West. One of those who made it is Vladislav Fedosov, who now plays for the New Jersey Devils of the National Hockey League. Fedosov was 31 and an established star when he begged Soviet authorities for permission to move to America. You know, the democracy coming down in the Soviet Union and it was a good time to say it. I want to be independent. I want to play hockey in different country. I want to play. That's why you hold me up. I want to play it. But system said, no, 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 you have to play another couple of three years. I was 31. I think it's no, I'm stop. I want to play it for myself now. Other players went on strike to support Fedosov's struggle to immigrate. He had to personally visit the Soviet Union's Minister of Defense and was finally given permission to leave. Not work your park. <laughs> Fedosov has settled in New Jersey and has managed to fit in well with his teammates. He's hardly alone. Last year, more than 20 other top Soviet players followed him to America. Come on, Come on. Ice hockey isn't the only sport with problems. Like the country itself, the entire sports establishment is in critical condition. This is a major soccer match at Moscow Dynamo. The stadium was built to hold 70,000 fans. On this Saturday night, only 2,700 have shown up. Empty stands and a collapse of government funding has thrown soccer into a financial crisis. And there's another problem. Like hockey players, soccer stars are heading west. One team sold eight of its 11 starters to teams in other countries. What uh, a flag. One of those players is Sergei Baltacha, formerly a star member of the Soviet national team. He once represented the Soviet Union in the World Cup, but now plays for a professional team in Scotland. His children have already learned English. Now they're trying to teach their dad. What's a Venus? Venus. 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 What is this? It's up the sky. Ah. It's a planet. Planet. Yeah. What's Mars? Switches. No. No planet. Yes. <laughs> Mars it can be a planet or Mars it can be a sweet. Two days before leaving, I went to the Soviet Sports Committee to get my papers. I was met by a representative, whose name I can't remember, who gave me instructions. He said, try to have as little contact with your English neighbors because those people are real so-and-sos, not to be trusted. It was funny to listen to because I had been abroad many times and knew it wasn't true. But instead I said, yes, yes, I will do what you want. What else could I say? That was the sort of rubbish they were giving us. We were being brainwashed. Those who have power really possess power over others. 
This is a big problem in the Soviet Union. It is the same in sport. If your coach doesn't like you, he can cut you within two minutes. In Soviet sport, respect is one way. It is the players who must respect the coach. There has never been a coach who respects the players. I think that is the difference between sport in the USSR and sport in England. Sergei and his wife Olga appreciate the supermarkets filled with food and the change in lifestyle. When I came to this country four years ago, the main advantage was that I was with my family every day. Every day I can see my children. When I played for Dynamo Kiev or for the national team, I used to be at home for only one month in the year. Their country has fallen apart, but Sergei and Olga have no regrets about what's taken place. Sergei feels the collapse was inevitable. The communist system, the socialist system, was designed in such a way that it had no basis, no foundation. Relations in sport, relations between players and coaches, relations between club managers and the sports committee were based on anger or force or dishonesty. That's why it all collapsed. Thank God it has collapsed. It would have been better had it happened 50 years ago. Top Soviet athletes have moved out, capitalists have moved in. Soviet professional teams are now being sold to the highest bidder. And their top gymnasts are performing in circus shows. What's become of the Soviet sports machine and what's ahead? when more than a game continues here on A&E. Everywhere you look, there are signs of a great transformation in what used to be the Soviet Union. In the shadow of the Kremlin, American fast food franchises are thriving. There's been a similar transformation in sports. The Ministry of Sport no longer exists. No one knows what will take its place. This is the famous Dynamo gym that produced so many Olympic champions. Now it's in a struggle for survival. The gym has been turned into a circus, its gymnasts into theatrical performers, ironically dressed in outfits that symbolize the West. They hope to tour the world. Foreign currency is needed to keep the gym alive. When Dynamo was faced with the problem of earning money, we began by renting out our gym, opening it up to groups who pay subscriptions, although children pay only 10 rubles. But the most important thing, and I want to stress this, is that we have become the masters of our own gym. When government funding came to an end, so did an entire era. Young athletes no longer have access to the best coaching and training. I suppose in a way you could say that everything is up for grabs in the Soviet Union now since uh, state funds to sport uh, have been cut off. And the only way to keep sports going um, is to find private funding. So, in many ways, the whole of Soviet sport has been privatized. Uh, even the Olympic team has had to have its uh, uniform um, completely uh, done for it by Adidas. And uh, you've now got a situation where businessmen are being encouraged to buy football teams. For example, Asmoral was a mediocre team in the minor leagues of Soviet soccer. Three years ago, the team was purchased by an Iraqi-Russian millionaire. Then in the Soviet version of free agency, he bought some of the best coaches and players in the country. If Asmoral's owner thought he could buy success, he was right. The team was transformed into a winner. 
Хаммерский центр. Да. Здесь Калининский проспект. Команды высшей лиги. They wouldn't sell us any of the big teams in the Premier League of the Soviet Union, like Dynamo or Spartak, Torpedo or the Red Army Club. But we had to create a team of very high quality. So we decided to buy a very weak team, make it strong, and get to the top of the Soviet League. But getting to the top of the Soviet League is only the first step. The real money in soccer is in Europe. That's where Al Khalidi hopes to turn a profit by selling his best players. When we're in the first division, we'll develop some good soccer players. You can imagine how nice it'd be to sell to Liverpool some Sasha or Misha for two million pounds. That would be good business. But the real business will start when we're in the UEFA Cup. Another example of the new Soviet entrepreneur is Igor Kononov. He's creating an exclusive tennis club for corporate membership. Joining the club won't be cheap. So far, only organizations and companies can be members of our club. At the moment, we do not have private membership. The annual membership of our club is quite expensive, even for millionaires and for wealthy people. It costs 50 or 60,000 rubles a year. Having paid this money, you can use the club and its services all the year round. We can't make the price any lower because there would be no profit for us. The new clubs are producing a new kind of player. Ten-year-old Anya Kornikova is already sponsored by a Western clothing company. I dream about playing tennis really well. I like tennis because I win. I like to be first and I want to win. My daughter wants to be a good player. She dreams about it. I hope that she will become a tennis player of a very high level. Perhaps she will be one of the ten best tennis players in the world. There is no point in working without dreams. Of course, I don't have a job now. I spend all my time with her. Anya is my work. Commercialism will develop so fast that uh, people will move away to the sports that uh, bring in most money. And there'll be an enormous drain of sports talent to uh, America and Scandinavia and Britain, Germany and France and so on. Um, and also with very little encouragement for sport uh, from the state and organization and planning and control, never again will we see uh, the Soviet Union or what takes its place um, achieving um, the sort of prominence in sport that we've seen in the past. The river of money that used to flow into athletics has dried up. The general public no longer cares. Soviet sports are in a battle to survive. A battle they're losing. The sense of the clubs like Spartak and Dynamo around Moscow, around the country, is that if some of these facilities haven't shut down, their days may well be numbered. The reason is that Boris Yeltsin and those in control think it's more important to feed people than it is to create super athletes. And he's made that, I think, quite clear in some of his actions and the way he's going to deal with the politics of the country. And I think that for the Russian, the Soviet sports machine, it's the, the cogs are slowing down and soon it will be just kind of a rusted hulk. For many years, the Soviet Union was considered our political and ideological enemy. But even during the height of the Cold War, we marveled at the Soviet sports dynasty and the great athletes it created. Now, that dynasty is coming to an end.
will shine its light.